I say men, I know that there's a significant proportion of women that listen, watch porn as well. But I have come to learn from doing this podcast and having conversations about dating apps and pornography. And when I look at the comment section, men are very angry, it seems, or at least the men that are in my YouTube comments that are on YouTube at dating apps. And they're mm -hmm. very, very angry and think the industry of porn, again, this is the subset of people in my comments, mm -hmm. they hate it. They think it's evil. They think it's disgusting. And I actually looked at Google search data before our conversation today to see what people are searching. Mm -hmm. And one of the most frequently searched terms as it relates to the subject of porn on a tool we use to analyze Google search data was, how do I stop watching porn? Yeah. And it almost seems like you think, you know, that, that was one of the most frequently searched terms that people are going to Google and saying, how do I stop this? Yeah. There's a certain lack of control and a certain... It's really addictive. Insidious, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really addictive. So should we ban it? <laughs> If you were Prime Minister of the UK, would you ban porn? You could press a button now, ban it. Yeah. There you go. Because I don't think, I mean, I just, the down, the only downside of banning it is basically the, um, it's sort of like during COVID when people were banned from doing things which everyone was doing, right? Banned from socialising, banned from seeing their families and people uh, in a lot of cases, kept doing it and just broke the law. And I think that that had a sort of destructive effect on attitudes towards the law. This also was one of the reasoning, uh, this is one one piece of reasoning behind um, legalising gambling back in the mid-20th century, that there was statistics showing that, like, an enormous number of people were gambling. Yeah. And so it just seemed ridiculous to ban something that everyone was doing. So that's one argument against banning porn, that, like, people would keep doing it it would be quite hard really with the internet, like yeah. realistically. Um, and so it would sort of undermine faith in the legal system in general. And I take that seriously, but I don't think it makes anyone's life better. Sex workers would have a big uh, rebuttal to you there and say, you know, it's a much better career for me than working some horrible job in some... There might be a small number of women for whom that's really true. But in general, I think, and this applies to other areas of sex industry, not just porn, um, the people you tend to hear from are the people who are doing best by it. And you also tend to hear from them at the point in their lives when um, they're in the middle of it and they are either haven't yet suffered the cost of it or are, are kind of have a self-protective narrative that they're telling themselves. And I've spoken to a lot of women who've been in the sex industry including on my podcast, who will talk about this exact feeling of like, when you're in it, it's, you just need to get through the day and telling yourself I'm empowered and this, this is okay and I'm, I'm in charge of this and whatever is a way of getting through the day. It's quite common for them to compare it to being in an abusive relationship. When, when you're in it, like, I love him, it's fine, you know, and then it's only afterwards, you've, after you've left the relationship and the emotional connection is gone, that you can realise how bad it was for you. And there are some quite high profile examples of this, like Jenna Jameson. She was one of the most famous porn stars in the world in the 90s. She's now a campaigner against the porn industry <clears throat> because she says it's just so, it's so exploitative. It causes so much psychological harm and physical harm. I mean, just things like STDs and injuries during... You're 18 times more likely to be murdered... Um, if you're a, a female porn star, yeah. according to a, a study by Sh Stuart Cunningham et al. Yeah. 2018. Yeah. And that, and that danger is even more acute in other areas of the sex industry. Um, there might be some people who really don't suffer those psychological effects and who find a way of doing it in the sort of safest possible way. And it's okay for them. I, I try, I like, I've spoken to those people, I trust that they exist, but I think they're very unrepresentative. And to say that we should basically design the law around those exceptions rather than around what would be better for the, the people who are suffering most, I think is wrongheaded. I mean, in terms of the sex industry in general, I would favour what um, the law as it is in places like Ireland and Sweden and France and quite a lot of other countries where basically buying sex is against the law, but selling sex isn't against the law, which I know seems kind of counterintuitive, but basically you say that the punters are criminalized. I'm talking about like on street sex work and brothels and stuff. Yeah. The punters are criminalized, but the prostituted women are not. 
so they don't have anything to fear from the police and they can get support from social services and they can get help with addiction and they can get you know all the all the various issues that are so much more likely to they're so much more likely to confront but the punters are disincentivized from because it's all fueled by demand right if there weren't if there weren't men who wanted to buy sex if there weren't men watching porn and women too if there weren't people watching porn the industry would collapse like it all depends on demand this young generation are going to grow up with pornography on their phones since birth yeah you know what i mean like your yeah. your kids are going to be able to access pornography Sometimes accidentally, if you scroll Twitter. I know, it's terrifying. Um, from yeah. the, the minute, while their brains are forming. Yeah. And that's the first real generation that have had pornography from birth. Yeah. Yeah, it's really bad. I mean, this is why smartphones, it's why I worry about smartphones. I mean, there are other reasons, there are other problems with smartphones, like in terms of things like bullying through yeah. social media, whatever, but the porn one is really bad. It's very addictive. It, it really damages your real world relationships. It affects your sexual tastes as well. Like it's more, you're more likely to, it's not like porn invents these things. Like there's something like the choking phenomenon. It hasn't like invented it out of thin air. It's it's feeding on um, an existing dynamic where women tend to want to be dominated and men tend to want to dominate. But it exaggerates it and it like, mm. it, it, it turns neural pathways into, in your brain into motorways, you know, because you're constantly reinforcing this this positive response to the stimulus with orgasm, which is like a very, like you're training your brain, basically. And that point of choking, the other thing that um, pornography does is it kind of resets your expectations of people's bodies and how yeah. people should look. Yeah. Not just how they should perform in bed, et cetera, and yeah. the way sex should be, but how they should look. And obviously there's been this huge rise in plastic surgery driven by social media, but also probably by pornography and expectations of how the body should look. Yeah. Which seems to be playing into all of this. 